and we must then go on. Okay, so now, <clears throat> now we are beginning Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 79, section D, fourth section, page 222, actually. And we've been seeing how we can build up a horoscope based on the personality ray, where the average non-aspiring individual is concerned. So without aspiration, we will not have soul influence. That is what DK seems to be telling us. If we do not aspire, we cannot receive the energy of the soul, and we cannot be considered to be uh, true disciples uh, centered increasingly in our soul energy. That is what uh, he is saying. Okay, everybody, let us go on. This is Esoteric Astrology Adventure, uh, Section D, page 222. We were concluding with the idea that there should be, uh, in setting up the horoscope of the non-aspiring, the average non-aspiring man, the attempt to determine what is the personality ray and then to work from that personality ray uh, considering uh, the orthodox planets, or I guess the orthodox rulers, uh, laid out in the uh, horoscope of the houses, I added. And DK seems to say that elsewhere as well. <clears throat> we recall that the rays given by the esoteric well, by the rulers of the um, signs of the fixed cross were to be considered sub-rays of the soul ray. Well, this is something different. We're not yet talking about the soul ray. We will in just a moment. <clears throat> but we study the personality of the man. We look at the physical indicators as the personality puts its stamp very much upon the physical apparatus. We look also at the emotional qualities and the type of presumably lower mind because the personality ray will put its stamp there as well. And the nature of the environment which the personality ray has um, evoked. The associates of the individual, the placement of his activities and so forth, the kind of work, profession, etc., the general environment personality ray will be, the, the environment will be declarative to a degree of the personality ray. And he'll be able to lay out then, the astrology will, a far more useful chart with the orthodox planets ruling. It doesn't mean that we will not have um, sacred planets ruling because many of the sacred planets are orthodox rulers, precisely. But they will operate in an orthodox manner rather than in a specifically spiritual manner. Because the individual is non-aspiring and the aspect of the soul uh, is not playing a large role in the life, certainly not a conscious role. Now this is important for all of us, those who study Master DK's work uh, seriously. Uh, in the case of the horoscope of a disciple, he should do the same, endeavoring to discover the ray of the soul. And uh, I've oftentimes pointed to page 335, <coughs> excuse me, of Esoteric Psychology, Volume 2, for simple methods of discerning the soul ray. There will be physical and psychological indications, and there will be the indications of the individual's profession and his associates, but also the life struggle that sometimes occurs, the so-called midlife crisis, not necessarily occurring in midlife, sometimes earlier, sometimes later, in which the normal orientation of the man gives way to something quite new, which is dominated, uh, a way of life dominated by the ray of the soul. Sometimes this can go on for years, this kind of struggle, and sometimes it can happen, let us say, 
much more suddenly. So check out that page, Esoteric Psychology 2, page 335. Um, the soul only sets its mark and emphasizes its quality and nature in the case of advanced people. So we pretty well realize that individuals who are dealing with the fifth petal of the egoic lotus, being the uh, petal which is uh, the first one to which the solar angel really pays attention, or should we say he pays more meditative attention to the man when the process of organizing and opening the fifth petal is underway. This fifth um, petal marks the period when the soul ray uh, is operating upon the advanced human being. Before that point, before there is an integrated personality, which is also one of the uh, factors involved in the uh, expression of the fifth petal, before that point we really don't have the advanced human being. So the soul ray is setting its mark and emphasis, its quality and nature, in the case of advanced people. And when that emerges clearly, with, you know, and in DK's saying it's not profitable necessarily, to look at everybody and say, well, what is your soul ray? Or try to find that because it just hasn't emerged. I mean, to, to the expert diagnosis of the master, of course, he can see it. He can see it visually and in terms of color and note and so forth. He knows. But in terms of the emergence on the physical plane and from the usual methods that we might be able to discern it, it just hasn't happened. So the soul ray only sets its mark and emphasizes its quality and nature in the case of advanced people. And when that emerges clearly, the man is obviously a disciple. So he's saying here that the emergence, the clear emergence of the soul ray indicates the disciple. And when that emerges clearly, when the soul ray emerges clearly, the man is obviously a disciple. And the esoteric planets will then govern his chart. Presumably, all of the various rulers in their esoteric positions. And the signs of the zodiac towards which they point. In other words, Mars in the exoteric chart will point to Aries. And to a degree, Scorpio. But Mars in the esoteric chart, as an esoteric ruler, will only point to Scorpio and not to Aries. And the connection, therefore, between the planet and a particular sign of the zodiac will be determined by the level of the individual. And Jupiter, in the ordinary sense, can point to Sagittarius or Pisces, but in the disciple, it will connect with the energies of Aquarius. And about this we have discussed earlier. The esoteric planets will then govern his chart. I suppose especially the esoteric ruler of the rising sign, and uh, later the esoteric ruler of the sun sign as well. Having determined the ray of the man undergoing tests in Scorpio, I assume he means the soul ray here, the astrologer can then place the other rays in relation to him and his probable experience. Well, the other rays are the six uh, rays we've been speaking of, which are conveyed by the rulers of the fixed cross. But maybe most specifically, the sixth ray of Mars and the fourth ray of Mercury, and the fourth ray of the constellation Scorpio itself. Uh, if we're really undergoing tests in Scorpio, you are an advanced human being. So, uh, only the advanced human being can undergo such tests, and thus the esoteric rulers, writers, <laughs> rulers will apply. So that would be most interesting to build up these two different kinds of horoscopes. It would be around the soul ray plus the indications of the rising sign, just the way 
The horoscope for the average non-aspiring individual would be built up around the um, personality ray, its planet, and the sun sign. Of course, you can't throw that out when you're dealing with the uh, disciple because the disciple definitely has a personality with which that disciple is attempting to deal in a spiritual manner. And it causes a lot of opposition and is significant for the resolution of the disciple's problems. Okay, so right here on page 222 and 223, DK has given us some very important indicators about how to set up that more useful charts for two kinds of people, those on the ordinary wheel clockwise and those on the reverse wheel. And he didn't say, go to the horoscope and attempt to determine the personality ray and the, the soul ray. As I say, one day, given sufficient uh, st statistical sample, we may find some infallible indicators, but so far I don't think it's the profitable way to operate or the way likely to produce accuracy. I think it's far better, as DK says, to study the physical, emotional, and mental characteristics, study the character of the individual, study the environment, because the environment will be declarative of the rays which are in expression. Just think about that, the people you know, the environments in which they find themselves. Those environments have predominating rays, and it's very probably the ray of the individual, whether personality or soul ray, which has somehow um, created a magnetic link with that particular environment. And so the environment proves revelatory of the ray in question. A little thought is required to come to accurate conclusions. <clears throat> the other point to which I sought to refer, says DK, is the constant use of the word relation and relationship in analogous phrases. I guess it's a secondary word. It has to do with the magnetic attraction or repulsion between various factors. It's a Mercurian word also. Particularly the, the 246 line is involved with this word. But uh, the science of all relations, let us say, it's a second-ray science, I think. And when we look towards producing an idea of the relations between the different signs of the zodiac, we find that Gemini, a second-ray sign, is prominent. Gemini triangulating all of the pairs of opposites except the one in which it is involved with Sagittarius and that is triangulated by um, Pisces, a sign intimately related to Gemini for its second ray qualities. Perhaps Pisces is the most ostensibly cosmically second ray constellation sign with which we have to deal, even though Virgo brings in more second ray at this time, and Gemini is even shaped like the number two and is an obvious relational factor. So he wants to discuss the constant use of the word relation and relationship. This is unavoidable for the reason that the entire science of astrology is in the last analysis the science of relations. And there is consequently no use in avoiding the term, especially when there is no other which seems to meet the requirements as adequately. I guess in the English language and maybe in more. The science of relations. And this is a, in a way, well, it has to have both third ray and second ray factors. But um, a second ray is the ray of beauty in relationships, the ray of the divine pattern. Patterns are created by magnetic relationships. So we really want to know the effect of every factor upon every other. 
and reciproc reciprocally. So this will be one of those words which in a second ray approach to a basically third ray science we're going to use frequently. There's no use consequently. There's consequently no use in avoiding the term, especially when there is no other which seems to meet the requirements adequately. Interrelation, interdependence, intercommunication, there's a good Geminian word for us. Interplay, another Geminian word. Even interrelation is. These are words governing the scientific basis of astrology, and they are beginning to be words in general use today in connection with human affairs and human contact, conduct. Maybe we think back, uh, it's so common for us today, 80 years later. The science of relations is everywhere before us and has been developed along many modalities, especially, I suppose, uh, psychologically and in terms of international relations and the psychology involved there. We think this way in a rapidly uniting one world in which we can see the way anything said or done affects a host of recipients, individuals and nations and groups. So this will be increasingly the case and now some 80 years later after the book I suppose began to be written it is the case. The preparatory stages for world fusion, blending, and synthesis are present at this time, and certainly we see this in the one world presented by the Internet and all the happenings upon which people can comment because it touches their lives, or at least touches their psyches or their minds. We are in that stage now of world fusion and of blending and synthesis and so much of the conflict that we have is the resistance against this synthetic inevitability. The ego, lower ego, will fight like mad to preserve its individualistic prerogatives. I'm interested in the philosopher Ayn Rand who had quite a re reaction against uh, Soviet collectivism and developed an extremely individualistic philosophy which a number of political uh, figures on today's political stage uh, seem to uh, accept. That individualism is the way and can we really separate uh, individualism from capitalism? Even if we look at uh, the corporation as an individual it is the advancement of the one at the expense of the many, although it is philosophized as other than that, as if the as if competition rather than cooperation and the advancement of an excellent few will lift the whole. Well, there's there's a sense in which that can be the case, but usually this individualistic advancement is selfishly pursued no matter how uh, rationalized in various euphemistic terms. So the preparatory stages for world fusion, blending, and synthesis are present at this time. And in this fact lies the hope of the world and the surety of the ultimate solution of the world problem along right lines. And what is this world problem? You know, all under the great heresy. Well, how do you spell that? <laughs> heresy of separateness. This is the problem. Having the limited consciousness which simply sees the part and its welfare independently of the whole and oftentimes at, at the expense of the whole. The little ego grabs what it can to fulfill its materialistic desires, desires which are not in accord with the divine plan and with the still more remote purpose. 
consciousness has not reached that point. That's the whole purpose for fighting the battle with the Hydra, the elevation of consciousness into a more Aquarian, group-centered, whole-centered uh, perspective. Anyway, this um, the study of astrology is the study of all these relations which are part of the whole with which one is dealing. I mean, we're obviously not dealing with the entirety of the whole. We're simply dealing with uh, individuals, groups, uh, nations, our planet, our planet in relation to other planets, all in relation to our solar system, and then vaguely our solar system in relation to other solar systems and to great constellations, which are still of a relatively local nature. The, it, the whole setup seems vast to us. It is vast, relatively, but it's just minuscule in our tiny little galaxy, which is only one of billions, hundreds of billions. So the dwarfing scope of the whole. It, it rather works against individualism. <laughs> it works towards synthesis. The individual really fades out, and only the whole is seen. The whole matters, but against that, the personality, the little self, the lower ego, fights strenuously, and we're in the middle of the fight right now. The Piscean forces seem to um, embrace lower egoism, the Aquarian forces, although not properly schooled and eliminative of much individual excellence, do seem to embrace a fuller picture. Um, and this, this, I think, you know, we'll see this in uh, America and Russia, both of which have the Aquarian soul. There are experiments which have been uh, inadequate uh, up to this time, but much better can be expected in the future when a, a deeper meaning of Aquarianism emerges because the sixth ray and Piscean influences have faded out in the 21st century and early 22nd century. In connection with the vertical and horizontal life of the fixed cross, it is instructive to note that the vertical life of the man upon the cross, no matter in what sign his son may temporarily find position. See how he really emphasizes the fixed cross for the disciple, regardless of where in one tiny little life one may have one's son positioned, is ever Aquarius Leo. <coughs> Excuse me. The Aquarius factor, the group factor, the universal factor being the dominant. And Leo uh, representing the individual, but also in another sense, uh, the group and the whole, is the subsidiary, the receptive. It's almost as if Aquarius in some way represents the cosmic ethers and the universal perspective, and Leo represents the more localized uh, individual perspective, which must become imbued with this more cosmic perspective. So this indicates that the self-centered individual in Leo, that's in the beginning at least, learns the lesson of the cross and becomes decentralized, group conscious, and given to service. That's so very Aquarian. Those words describe Aquarius to a T, uh, more than adequate description of Aquarius. Decentralized, group conscious, and given to service. Well, of course there are undeveloped Aquarians too, in which decentralization is no virtue and group consciousness is simply following the crowd and the service is the service of the self. But Leo, as we know, is centralized. Although there's a type of centralization later, which is centralization within the one as the one, and that is a supremely advanced state. Leo is individually conscious until the individual becomes the whole. And Leo uh, demands service of others until later heights of service are reached in this sign as in Aquarius. So this indicates that the self-centered individual in Leo learns the lesson of the cross and becomes decentralized group conscious and given to service. Now remember, you know, to be a Leo is not necessarily an indication of a lower stage of evolution than to be an Aquarian. 
one can be at any stage of evolution and have uh, various signs in the chart. The horizontal arm um, is uh, Taurus Scorpio, indicating that desire for materiality, presumably in, in Taurus, is finally superseded by desire for spiritual values. Now remember, again, this is just a general statement, because it's possible to have the Scorpio person uh, wants to really corner the market and selfishly following the monster of selfishness, the Hydra, grab all it can for itself and to have the very selfless, um, illuminated individual desiring nothing but spiritual values in Taurus, such as the Buddha was and Socrates and many uh, great thinkers and philosophers found in Taurus. Statistically, it's been shown, I think, that there's a close association of uh, Taurus and Virgo to modern-day philosophy, I guess the pursuit of the light in Taurus and the cultivation of wisdom in Virgo give us this tendency. So the horizontal arm is Taurus Scorpio, indicating that desire for materiality is finally superseded by desire for spiritual values. And interestingly en enough, the illumination found in Taurus is also the fourth stage of meditation ruled by Scorpio. Illumination. Beginning, as we know, concentration, Leo, meditation, Virgo, contemplation, Libra, and illumination, Scorpio. So the opposites are opposites in some respect and meet in others. Even in terms of physical appearance, one can oftentimes uh, confuse an individual uh, of a certain sign for an individual of the opposite sign. There are, there are some, perhaps, discriminative uh, perceptions which can differentiate even appearances which look quite closely related. If only that particular science of physiognomy were simpler. <laughs> but there's a way in which energies blend and fuse in the most complex manner. And a face is one wholeness reflecting that interplay, the relation <laughs> between the various factors. And each face is unique. So occasionally there's something that just stands out as absolutely identifiable, but often the skill in physiognomy has to do with reading the fusion of these energies. And one day uh, it will be possible, I think maybe some can already do it the, uh, to a degree, maybe portraitists, portrait painters, if they were astrologers too, would have a special ability uh, along this line. So spiritual values have come in as we have conquered our lower Tamasic nature in Taurus. They've come in as we conquer our Hydra in Scorpio. And this is demonstrated through the tests of Scorpio. Notice that word demonstrated. <laughs> well, or demonstrated in the way we demonstrate the soul, the daemon. Some people have thought that the daemon is the demon, have confused the two. Interestingly enough, the... Uh, sort of uh, elemental religions, religions that seem to worship the personality in one form or another, consider the daemon as a demon. They consider the solar angels as asuras instead of suras. So much so that the solar angels have come to be called asuras, even though they are really suryas, they are really representatives of the sun. So we've managed to invert a lot of things by our worship of the ancestral gods in the lower sense. So, Scorpio can um, go beyond many of the traps of Taurus, but Taurus, bringing in the light, you know, we can turn it around the other way, can shed great illumination on many of the traps that are found in the earlier Scorpio individual. No one sign being better or higher than another, although there are constellational lords which are probably more evolved than others. Setting up that uh, hierarchy would be perhaps a difficult thing, but we, DK has already done it for the planets in a way. 
He's given us non-sacred planets, sacred planets, and among the sacred planets, certain of the synthetic planets, synthesizing planets, which are probably the most developed of all. Um, although not necessarily the most unfolded, they are the most developed. As I said, it's like having someone who's a third degree initiate who's 10 years old compared with an average human being which is who's 80 years old. And the 80 year old person is more unfolded but the 10 year old is more developed. <laughs> at least that's one way of looking at it. Earth and water, Taurus and Scorpio must be blended I suppose to create the proverbial garden, the new garden of Eden must be blended and related and it is, um, it is this truth connected with these two signs of the zodiac which lies behind all teachings upon baptism and purification. I guess the mud, the mud of Taurus must be washed away by the experience of the drastic waters of Scorpio. Baptism and purification. Well, we can, we can have a miry situation produced in many ways. Perhaps all earth and water signs can be combined somehow to create the mire. But eventually the, the mire and the slime and the strictly earthly remnants of bygone times which inhibit uh, the response that only the pure can give to the divine um, that must be washed away. Sometimes the tears of Pisces are very adequate to wash away our earthly adhesions. I think DK uses that word adhesion somewhere, but it has to do with a kind of an attachment which shouldn't be. The earthly material desires of Taurus must in due time be brought under the influence of the purifying water in Scorpio, and it's sometimes, I think, sometimes hot water, really. In Scorpio, we get ourselves into hot water. We experience the crises that make us sweat. Cold sweat, hot water, cold sweat, those things which perhaps we had rather not face, but are forced to do so. He's giving it the slant to us in only one way, but elsewhere in the Cancer chapter we'll see that he reverses it. Taurus going to Scorpio, Scorpio going to Taurus, ending in illumination. I'll just give you an idea of that right now. You probably already know it, but it's uh, Esoteric Astrology, approximately page 329, something like that. Or That's the light. That's the discussion of the light. Maybe the pairs of opposites come in a little later. Oh. And uh, yes, here it is. Taurus Scorpio, powerful focus, lower desire, leads to death and defeat. The triumph of the lower nature, that's Scorpionic, which eventuates in the awakening to society and death, that's a Scorpionic realization. The man is prisoner of desire. And at the moment of consummation, knows his prison. So this has something to do with the whole sexual realization as binding one to earth. Uh, but it comes later and we see that Scorpio eventually uh, leads to Taurus, which is an extension of the idea we've just been studying here. The, li the final victory of soul over form form is that of the Hydra. Death and darkness demonstrate, death and darkness of the Hydra demonstrate as light and life. As a result of this energy relationship, the dark night of the soul, presumably in Scorpio, when all kinds of horrors are realized and one experiences the bitter woe on the fixed cross, the dark night of the soul becomes radiant sun, or becomes the radiant sun. In Taurus, I see the greatest light. So you see how there's, I guess, kind of an upward spiral here. You know, it would probably be, let's say, Taurus, Scorpio, Taurus, Scorpio, Taurus, and so forth. Taurus always leading to Scorpio, Scorpio always leading to Taurus. I'm a still higher turn of the spiral. Every 
uh, movement is an increase in altitude. And so it goes for all the pairs of opposites. Now, um, so there's this, you know, perhaps scalding experience. The heat of the emotions, the heat of the mother, is involved in the Scorpio experience. And this, I've sometimes noticed, you know, one of those rare occasions when I'm doing the dishes, <laughs> instead of the dishwasher doing the dishes, that when you turn the water very, very hot, very hot, and here in Europe it's very hot, you get rid of the adhesions much faster. Let's say there's peanut butter. To use a homely example, attached to a knife, adhering to a knife, an adhesion, peanut butter adhesion. Well, you can run a lot of cold water, it just stays there, adhering. Run the hot water, and the peanut butter will melt away. Same for butter in general, melting away under hot water. So there is this Martian heat we do experience in these trying emotional experiences, which are typical of the second initiation, though Scorpio was testing on all the levels we have learned. Baptism by water, a name given for the second initiation, needs a preparatory period of testing and purification hmm, before the real admin, uh, the initiation can be administered, we have to pass these tests before the portal of initiation. We have to prove something. We have to prove that we have a certain quality which is resonant with that on the further side of the door. It's a familiar idea to us as students of occultism. Baptism by water, a name given to the second initiation, needs preparatory period of testing and purification. Purification comes in along many signs, of course. Virgo is one of the preeminent signs of purification. Any of the fire signs can do it. But the water signs as well. The purificatory tests of fire and water. The baptisms by water and fire. Fire being the medium of baptism more in the new age, the age which Christ predicted. But somehow Scorpio is hot and watery at the same time. And thus the experience in Scorpio, and this the experience in Scorpio is intended to give. Baptism by water. Now we're told that John the Baptist um, was a Gemini, but he certainly had to have had one of the water signs. He was uh, passing through the second degree. Gemini can be associated with the second degree, but so can, um, so can Scorpio. And maybe Pisces, too. Anyway, uh, finding his way into the River Jordan and uh, washing away the sins, as it were, in anticipation of one who could do it ever so much better, was um, indicative of the second degree for him and probably some preliminary testing for others. It could have been Scorpio, it could have been Pisces. One of those water signs, though, I suspect, won't it be wonderful to actually to study the real horoscopes of real figures, historical figures, and to know what they actually were. We're so far away from that, but, you know, we know enough historically about certain figures, and if we actually had their real horoscope, and the horoscope of several lives, just imagine, I mean, that day will come. You can be sure that many of us who are interested in esoteric psychology and astrology will have before us the opportunity to study the sequence of horoscopes and ray charts, which will open the door to the method of development that the individual has been undergoing. Wouldn't it be interesting, you know, for us to know that in our own case, even right now, whether or not you can look at your astrological chart and choose the north or south node of the moon and the moon's position and so forth and say, well, this is what it was. I have grave reservations about that. I think it's an interesting guess, but unless it's accompanied by actual memories and not... Um, fabrications by the imagination. We don't really have the confirmation and, and we also need true clairvoyant vision and, and at this point it wouldn't hurt to have the confirmation of the master when attempting to see one's past and or future in the horoscope. So likewise, fire and air, Aquarius and Leo, must also be blended. 
Uh, so we have the blending of the opposites and bl eventually the blending of all four. They are going to meet at the center. Likewise, fire and air, Aquarius and Leo, must also be blended. Aquarius, of course, air, Leo, fire. And thus the four elements as well as six out of the seven rays must all play their part in conditioning the man in Scorpio for the final stages of the path. And you would have to ask, and why not these six rays for all those who are focusing upon the fixed cross? You see, he does talk about Scorpio here, but really the the rays available are the same for anyone upon the fixed cross, at least through the esoteric rulers. So the blending occurs of the opposites, but then there is a, I don't know how we can describe it, but you know, sort of uh, like this, four-leaf clover idea. I realize that everything I'm doing will look backwards here. <laughs> but um, that four-leaf clover is... Um, graded with each loop being of lesser radius and converging all upon the center where the individual truly can stand without emphasizing one or the other overly much and avail himself of all of these energies which are expressions basically of his soul ray considered sub rays of his soul ray um, okay. The place of the planets in this sign, Scorpio again, we cannot forget, although what he says of Scorpio, you know, does obviously apply to other members of the fixed cross, Scorpio in this case, is also most revealing and in line also with the general purpose of the experience in Scorpio as outlined above, you know purification, triumph, liberation, establishing oneself firmly in spiritual values and with a higher polarization altogether leading to illumination. So the place of the planets in this sign is also most revealing and also in line with the general purpose of the experience in Scorpio. Although I'm sure it can be a very diversified experience depending upon which heads of the Hydra one is dealing with and what particular initiation one is applying for, there is kind of a general experience of liberation going on here in Scorpio. Uranus is exalted in Scorpio. The power of Venus is lessened in this sign and the moon falls. What do these facts symbolically portray? Let me see if I can make the beauty of these implications clear to you. We have talked about that exalted Uranus as a tremendous ex liberative expression. What is the idea? <coughs> Pardon me. That the exalted planets may indeed be the most find the most powerful expression in the particular sign in which they are exalted. Venus will here represent, I suppose, the mental nature, pure and simple, and the Moon representing all the lower elemental tendencies which have to be conquered. I've seen um, in the horoscopes of some pretty prominent fourth-like degree initiates, Sir Thomas More, Krishnamurti, Francis Bacon, Uranus and Scorpio. So it really is uh, a rising up into the cosmic ethers as a result of the liberation, uh, bringing in a tremendous transformational power. It could be applied alchemically, could be applied emotionally, mentally, but it's highly transformative. So let's see what it is the Tibetan is going to say about this, because we are told quite a story by the rulerships and the detriments and the exaltations and the falls. Uranus is the planet whose characteristics are the scientific mind, that's one of them, which at this stage of the disciple's career means that he can begin to live the occult life and the way of divine knowledge can take the place of the mystic way of feeling. Well, the mystic way of feeling, Neptune, 
Uranus, the scientific mind, and even more so, the occultly scientific mind, seeing rather than mystically feeling what is actually happening and how he can extricate himself, the sure and definite science of release can become his, the knowledge of the methods of liberation can become his. Sometimes it's the scientific mind in general, and the person is not yet the disciple, but at this stage of the disciple's career, when he's fighting the battles during the phases of the first three initiations, he can begin to live the occult life. The scientist or the artist is not necessarily yet the disciple, nor is the disciple necessarily the scientist or the artist, but uh, to be an advanced human being as an artist or a scientist uh, marks a certain level of achievement, but to become a disciple is yet another step. So the way of divine knowledge, the ability to live the occult life, to know what one is doing with a degree of intuitive certainty, to have the actual science of occultism revealed to one and to be able to apply it in a thoroughgoing manner. These are the gifts of Uranus, and a major, major transformation and elevation occurs here. As I'm looking at these arhats, you know, they really were lifted out of the realm of struggle and into uh, an identification with the cosmic ethers. Uranus is a lightning-like destructive energy which... Uh, finally solved the age-old problem of attachment. It's a higher octave of Mercury, and we remember that Mercury is the planet which, by dispelling illusion, uh, solves the problem of the Hydra. And by dispelling illusion, along with Saturn, Saturn-Mercury, gives entree into the Buddhic realm and the fourth initiation. And Uranus would, of course, give a, a still more complete freedom. Uh, into the cosmic ethers and the buddhic plane, and probably tending towards the atmic plane and full mastership, because Uranus is the veiled hierarchical ruler of Leo, and Leo being the fifth sign, I think, has much to do with becoming a master. So Uranus in, in um, Scorpio means that knowledge can be transmuted into the way of wisdom and of light. So it's the knowledge of Mercury, the knowledge of uh, Venus, but there's this transmutation, and Uranus is, well, it's a planet of transmutation, transformation, transfiguration, ultimately translation, a word which suggests Mercury, but Uranus is the higher octave of Mercury, that knowledge can be transmuted into the way of wisdom and of light. It's not so much a planet of love, although it is interestingly associated with the Syrian line of energy and with the way the second ray descends into the hierarchy. There are a number of ways he talks about the transmutation of knowledge into wisdom. Venus is one of those planets, and I suppose uh, Mercury being a planet of knowledge and also a planet of booty can be involved in the transmutation of knowledge into wisdom. Jupiter, too, unites heart and mind. So... Um, the mind is knowledge and the love is related into wisdom, the love and wisdom of the heart. A number of these planets are transmutated, but we have here the way of wisdom and of light. He doesn't mention love in relation to Uranus, interestingly. So this necessarily brings in the will aspect with which Uranus is richly endowed because of its first ray monad and all of its hardline rays. This necessarily brings in the will aspect or the influence of the first ray. Vulcan, at least in the soul sense, blended with the seventh ray, Uranus. Uh, there's kind of a high and low here. Vulcan at the head and Uranus in many places, but also at the base of the spine, also in the sacral center, also in the throat center, also in the head center. <coughs> so this necessarily brings in the will aspect with the influence of the first ray, Vulcan, which is uh, the ruler of Taurus, just as Uranus is the, is the uh, exalted ruler of Scorpio. 
first ray and seventh ray, crown and base, in a way, producing the desired manifestation upon the physical plane. So the divine will, Vulcan in this case, or the will of the soul, manifests through the materializing power of Uranus, found in the sacral center, where there's a definite materializing power, but also, since it's connected with the seventh um, manifested creative hierarchy, definitely connected with manifestation upon the dense physical plane. The moon leads to Cancer. The moon, as the ruler of that uh, seventh creative hierarchy, leads to Cancer, which is the seventh ray sign involved with manifestation. So we see how Uranus, the seventh ray, and Cancer all unite to produce manifestation, with Vulcan representing at this stage that which must be manifested. But Uranus is still a higher and more developed planet than Vulcan. Uranus is, after all, the archetypal first-ray monadic planet. Vulcan is not. So this necessarily brings in the will aspect of the influence of the first-ray Vulcan blended with the seventh-ray Uranus, producing the desired manifestation upon the physical plane. Uranus, therefore, this you know, excellent about Uranus, initiates a new order of life and conditions. That's a new and better way. That's what Uranus is meant to do. And just think about Uranus and Aries right now, causing uh, many rebellions, but uh, through the dissatisfaction of the conditioning, the rigid conditioning in which Saturn has landed so many people when improperly interpreted as a rigid authoritarian control. Uranus, therefore, initiates a new order of life and conditions, and this, when developed in the life of the disciple, in its turn produces an understanding of the causes of things as they are. Archetypes are the causes. Of course, this is a real high form of science, isn't it? We're dealing with the cult mind here, dealing with the cult science. These are the real causes. So Uranus is a major planet of occultism. True archetypal causes. Producing an understanding of the cause of things. Okay, as they are. And the desire to change the old order and old orientation into the new. And I think we find, you know, a lot of uh, people in Scorpio with strong Uranus there wanting to overthrow. Desire to overthrow. Uh, Aquarius has this, and some of the major revolutionaries have had strong Aquarius, but Scorpio as well. I'm thinking about. Uh, What's his first name? Is it Vladimir? Lenin? Lenin? Very strong Scorpio. And uh, although, yeah, and, and look at probably the Scorpio rising sign of Stalin, along with his Pluto, Mars opposition with Pluto on in that part of Taurus, which is, is on the star Algol, which represents piled up corpses. The two rulers oppose each other, you know, and that gives him a huge Scorpio influence, even though Probably his son was in the last degree of Sagittarius, amazingly. Okay, so this um, desire to change the old order, and even on the individual level, produces the reversal of the wheel. Dissatisfied, dissatisfied with the state of the kingdom. State of the kingdom is Leo. And uh, there's the staging of a kind of overthrow of the king. Or if the lower ego was in the king position, there is an overthrow of that lower identification through Scorpio. There's so many ways in which Scorpio can undermine uh, the kingdom. The kingdoms can be, of course, quite limiting. So if we, if we look here, and we go to page 333, I guess, Scorpio stages the release of Leo. The consciousness is identified in the lower ego, and it needs to be identified as the higher ego and as the group. And Scorpio, with its destructive power, stages this release. And Uranus is a big part of this staging, because it's out with the old order, overthrow the authoritarian regime, and bring in the new order. We can see how revolutionary, even in the sense of you know reversing the wheel, the reversal of revolution, how revolutionary is Scorpio. I think Fidel Castro was a Leo with Scorpio rising. Well, Napoleon was a Leo with Scorpio rising. 
Interesting how that drama may be working out in those people. Of course, you can wonder about Napoleon. I think, was his moon in Capricorn? I, I don't want to go looking for it right now, but the new order which he wanted to impose was very authoritarian, so you kind of wonder whether he escaped his Leo energy at all and, and went into the Scorpio, or whether Leo was simply using Scorpio. It's important to know whether the rising sign uses the sun sign or the sun sign uses the rising sign. Obviously, we want a condition in which the rising sign uses the sun sign. That's what we really want, and not otherwise. So anyway, this produces the reversal of the wheel when we get dissatisfied enough. So, if there is sufficient dissatisfaction, then there builds the impetus for the reversal the reversal of the reversal of the wheel. This can be seen happening today most clearly in connection with humanity and with world processes. Humanity is dissatisfied. Humanity wants something better. The Dark Lodge realizing this uh, stages a Scorpionic Rebellion. The big lie is told, illusion, glamour, deceit, all those Scorpionic things are put forward. Thinking about Joseph Goebbels with the sun in Scorpio, with Leo rising. <laughs> Well, which served which is hard to say, but certainly he was the propagandist of the big lie, and he uh, justified the rise of Germany's Hydra and the Hydra of all um, individualistic types which sought themselves, thought themselves superior. Anyway, um, the soul rises. It wants to break with the old and have that revolution which will put the soul in the driver's seat, and this will mean um, changing the old order, a reorientation into the new. Even the Nazis thought they were going to bring in something new, even though it was rooted in a fabrication about the Teuton of 250,000 years ago. So this can be seen happening today most clearly in connection with humanity and with world processes carried forward to its logical conclusion. See, he does quite a bit on Uranus in relation to Scorpio and the kind of uh, tremendous uh, transmutation, transformation, I won't yet say transfiguration, but for some it is so, kind of a reconfiguration that's possible with Uranus under Scorpio. When we think about Scorpio, we should never divorce that thought from the fact that Uranus is the exalted planet. So Scorpio has a very Uranian kind of outworking in terms of these rebellions and overthrows, uh, death to the old order. Carried forward to its logical conclusion, the influence of Uranus finally produces an unfolded spiritual consciousness in contradistinction to the human. So we're even transcending Mercury in relation to Scorpio, which is the fully human consciousness, very high perhaps, giving us admission into the uh, cosmic ethers and the buddhic plane eventually, but uh, a transcendent archetypal consciousness is given by Uranus. Uranus is somehow associated with heavenly one, the heavenly patterns, and this is even beyond the, the, the elevated human consciousness. Whatever we are as an archetype, and maybe that's found not only on the monadic plane, but on the logoic plane, whatever we are as an archetype, um, Uranus <coughs> will reveal that, our ultimate, the ultimate seed of the spirit, our, our, the will to unfold the purpose which we are, and the purpose is our identity. Uranus seems to govern that. And for this reason, then says the Tibetan, Uranus is exalted in this sign and assumes a position of power and directed influence. So if you are a Scorpionic type, Uranus is very strong, and simply by being on the fixed cross, he, he did bring in uh, the rulerships of the various elements of the fixed cross, but he didn't bring in the exalted planets, 
which in the case of uh, Taurus is the moon with its fourth ray and many other rays. In the case of Leo, um, well, there is no exaltation in Leo. In Scorpio, it's Uranus, and in Aquarius, well, uh, again, no exaltation. No exaltation in Aquarius and Leo, although some have said that uh, Mercury is to be considered the exalted planet in Leo. Some have said so. People in astrology, they say many things, and time remains for us to prove them or not. Well, okay, so we've come now to page 225, and this is the end of Esoteric Astrology Adventure, number 79, section D, page 225, and I'll see whether this is quite long enough to try to produce a program with or whether I'll go on and do one more. Um, but four hours have been spent in this program, and I think Brett will divide them in such a way that they become more uh, accessible and, and your downloading time is like not forever. But let us see, let us see.